I'm super excited. What a show we have tonight, huh? We're gonna go live. We're gonna talk to some Canadian comedy legends. All for a good cause. I am very pumped. Um, how many people from out of town came to do this? Wow. All of you. That's nuts. Well, thanks for coming. Um, before we get the show started, though, I am going to bring up the representative for the Get Real movement, who are sponsoring tonight's show. Make some noise for our, uh, for our, uh, Joseph. Joseph. Joseph, everybody! Thank you so much. Yeah, super excited to be here with y'all tonight. Uh, my name is Joseph Enriquez, he, him. I am the workshop and education coordinator at the Get Real Movement. Uh, just wanted to first and foremost extend a very big thank you to Janet for making us uh, tonight's charitable beneficiary. Um, for, for anybody that doesn't know, the Get Real Movement is a national nonprofit whose mission is to combat 2S LGBTQ plus discrimination, bullying, and racism in schools, summer camps, and workplaces all across Canada. Uh, and we really accomplished that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we accomplished that tr uh, through two main areas of focus, the first being education. So we offer uh, anti-black racism, inclusivity, and trans 101 workshops to students, caregivers, and workplaces. Um, and we also offer uh, online and in-person resources as well. Uh, the other side, the other area of focus is our youth support and uh, leadership developments. So we have after school programs, university chapters, uh, we also do summits and conferences, as well as our virtual counseling program too. So Janet was actually one of the actors who appeared in our educational resource, The Clinic, uh, which is a short film highlighting uh, the need for more inclusive healthcare in Canada. It's a short film that we put together at the Get Real Movement. Um, and it also provided tips for medical professionals who were seeking to make their practice more inclusive. Um, as somebody who's part of the trans community, resources like that are so, so important and really go hand in hand with the work that we do in schools. The feedback that we receive from students is overwhelmingly positive. Students within the community who have really gained a better sense of confidence in themselves, students who are allies outside of the community that have learned to support the people around them that come out to them. And on both sides, uh, this education really helps to dispel myths and misinformation that is all too rampant, especially online these days, uh, to really get to a better place of understanding and support. So. As a nonprofit, uh, fundraising to keep up with the, the demand of uh, our programming is a constant challenge. So events like these are so, so appreciated and so important. But yeah, if you want to learn more about the Get Real Movement, the work that we do, please do not hesitate to come up to me or Nico. We're just at a table there on the side. Just come say hi if you want to learn any more information about us. Uh, but again, just wanted to say very big thank you, everyone. most obnoxious trans bitch in Toronto to host this thing. I love it! Yay, allies! <laughs> oh, I love a room full of allies. You're adorable. I love you people. It, you're out, in, you're out in, in public. It's nice, you know, I just... <laughs> I mean, tone it down in public. That's my one piece of advice. If I get one more yes queen while I'm picking a wedgie in the park, I'm detransitioning. I'm doing it out of spite. Everyone wants to be so, yeah, work, slay. I don't work, I don't slay. <laughs> brave, I get brave all the time. Being called brave in public isn't the compliment some of you think it is. Especially when I'm trying to keep a low profile, mind my own business, have a breakfast sandwich at Tim Hortons, not have my spot blown up. And some lady comes in and she's sweating and crying. She's like, I saw you from outside. I saw you through the window and I was just so overcome with emotion. I just had to say something. I just wanted to let you know that you are so brave. And I'm like, the food here isn't that bad. <laughs> Four, three claps oh, from over there. No, you missed your chance. Allies, that's true allyship right there. Four claps for a Tim Hortons joke. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, it's better than the alternative. Joseph was talking about, you know, the misinformation that gets spread online. Um, you know, being, 
Being a comedian and a very public-facing trans person, I, I catch a lot of shit, a lot of hate online, and over time it gets easier and easier to handle. Um, but I found especially a lot of joy in when, when people try and target something that I couldn't give less a shit about, and it becomes funny to me again. That's my favorite. Like, I'll get this one all the time. This is a common one I get. Somebody will be like, when you die, when you're dead, like 600 years after that, when they dig up your bones, they're gonna be like, that's a man's bones. <laughs> and the first time I read that, I was like, who would fucking care? Who is that insecure that they lay awake at night just like, I hope my bones are fuckable to a necrophiliac paleontologist from the future. <laughs> Does this guy really think that in my lowest moments when I'm at home and my dysphoria is at its worst and I just hate how things turned out, I'm just looking at myself in the mirror with the curtains drawn, just like, <laughs> my bones! can't change my bones! <laughs> More importantly, what does that say about what this guy thinks those scientists are like? That's what I wonder. Does, does he think it's just a bunch of broy dudes digging up bones angry all day like, oh fuck, another dude, this sucks! This is the fifth dude today! None of these skeletons have tits! What am I supposed to honk? Seven years at Western U for nothing, bro! <laughs> I get this one a lot. This is, this is my new favorite. I love this one. Somebody will be like, you'll never have a period. <laughs> You're good. Good. I've never heard an endorsement for a period in my life. The only people who have ever wished for their period are two weeks late for it. I got another four claps from my one ally. I told you that's all I was going for tonight and I got it. Yes. Are you guys ready to start the show? Awesome. I am so excited to bring up your host. Uh, you know her, you love her. I met her at an acting class of all places uh, earlier this year, and I was just so charmed and, and stunned by her and inspired by her. She is so awesome, and I love her so dearly. Give it up for your host, Janet McMorty! Incredible. I am glad I have waterproof mascara on. Uh, thank you, Sam, my makeup artist. Um, so I'm Dr. Jana McMorty, and I host Second Act Actors. This is a podcast I started during the pandemic, a little passion project, because I started meeting more and more people who were like me, starting with Improv Level 1 online at the Second City. Where are my Improv Level 1 Second City people here who flew in? I kept meeting people who were not actors from the get-go, who were taking acting classes and improv classes. They started with a job, they started with a career and said, I want a second act. I want to do something completely different, something more creative, something more whimsical and soul-fulfilling. And so I started meeting more and more people, and I wanted to share their stories with everybody. So that's the, how my podcast got started. And we just did 100 episodes have been released. And so this is a celebration of that. And I so appreciate you all being here. You are all some of my biggest supporters, people from acting classes, people who've been on the show before, volunteered your time to be on my crazy passion project. I so, so appreciate it. And um, I want to give a special shout out to my dad, who is in the audience today. 
he flew in from Vancouver and Hello. yeah <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of chatter on the podcast about people who were influencers early on in our lives who said, you know, maybe you should do a more yeah, logical career path. Like you're a really cute theatrical child, but that's not a logical career path. And even though I went the logical career path, I went to the most logical place, doctor, I never heard that from my parents. I never heard, no, you shouldn't do that whimsy. You shouldn't do that creativity. In fact, just yesterday, my dad and I were talking about how what he wants from his two daughters more than anything is confidence. <laughs> Feeling confident in who we are, in ourselves. And yeah, thanks, Dad. Oh, no, I'm sorry I made you emotional. I'm getting emotional. Thanks, Dad. All right, now I'm going to bring out my special guests tonight. They are Canadian comedy legends. First off, we have Deb McGrath, Second City alumni. She did a sketch of Marilyn Monroe that goes down in history as one of the funniest things I've ever seen. She, you know her from Little Mosque on the Prairie. She's been nominated for multiple Writers Guild Awards. She is absolutely hilarious. Deb McGrath, wanna come on down? <laughs> Who else saw her dancing during COVID? I know I did. <laughs> All right, and my second guest tonight is, you know, your I don't know, you're the better half, let's be honest. <laughs> Colin Mockery, you know him from Whose Line Is It Anyway? And if you're from a generation I've learned significantly younger than mine, you go, that's the guy from the meme, the Who's Awesome? You Are meme, Colin Mockery. <laughs> Is, I'm so, so thrilled to be speaking with you both. It's such an absolute honor. I would love to start with both of your stories. I would love to hear how you got into this crazy business, into this entertainment industry. Me? Yeah, why not? Um, I was uh, just a ham bone from the get-go. <laughs> Dancing, singing, you know doing shows in my garage and rec room. Um, and I, uh, I thought I would be a musical comedy. That was my dream. And then uh, Second City happened. Um, I uh, was working right across the street from the old fire hall where Second City started in Toronto and uh, at a place called Mr. Green Jeans. And uh, yeah, and... Uh, uh, the dear, late, great Tony Rosado, I don't know if any of you know Tony, he, um, he was my regular customer. And it wasn't a, um, you know, dating kind of thing. He thought I was funny and he said, you know, you're serving. I said, yeah, uh, I'm an actor. I went to, uh, oh, what's the name of Ryerson now? TMU. 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 Um, <laughs> I went to TMU. God, they could have picked a better name. Anyway, um, and so he got me an application for the classes, sat at the back when I auditioned. Uh, he really um, made me go. What can I tell you? I was too nervous. So I started at Second City and uh, did, I guess, five, six years there. And then, you know, went on to television and that kind of thing. But at Second City, I blew my voice out twice. So I, I uh, uh, had nodes and then polyps. And so to sing without a microphone wasn't going to happen. Little did I know that musical comedy would become everyone wearing that and being able to do it anyway. But um, yeah, and so I, I loved it, got into it, did a lot of stuff, a lot of television. And then our daughter was born, and I just kind of wanted to do that. But I had a great um, 
Um, I had a great career in voice and animation. So I did that, but I stepped back from anything that would take me away from her. And uh, this one started to be successful. <laughs> so his career, you can imagine my parents were so happy and proud when I married an improviser. <laughs> oh, oh dear God, that wasn't even a job. And, um, so true. and uh, so true. true. And uh, then, uh, oh, and it happened and his career gave me the opportunity to do both things I wanted to do and to be the class parent and do all the, that's what I wanted, I wanted to do that. And then she got old enough and I went back and, uh, and that's my story of how I started the business. <laughs> Yeah, mine was the same. Uh, I was um, in school in Vancouver. I was a honor student, and my plan, valedictorian. And um, thank you, um, allies. Um, I, um, I, my plan was to be a marine biologist. I was very shy. Uh, child, and uh, I was a, a bookworm. I used to go to the Vancouver Library every week, take out seven books, uh, read them all, and a friend of mine, Roland Rossman, uh, dared me to try out for the school play. So I did, and I, I got it, and I got my first laugh, and that moment I actually uh, will never forget, because it was that I felt a change there. I thought, no, this, forget about learning. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I want to do. Uh, so I, I went to the theater, went to Studio 58 there, uh, where after my first um, year, the head of the program said, you're very good at low comedy. <laughs> I took it as a compliment. <laughs> I'm not sure he was giving it as one. And then uh, my last year there, I, got, um, I saw a demonstration of a thing called theater sports, which was uh, started by um, an Englishman who uh, was living in Calgary. It was improv in a theater, um, in a sports, and Keith Johnstone uh, had started it. So um, I thought, oh, this looks like fun. So I started doing that. We were um, at City Stage, which was right beside McDonald's. And uh, they, uh, Ray Michael, who ran the theater, said, you can have, you know, the, after our show, you can have the uh, sort of 11 to 1 slot. And so we would run into McDonald's and go, hey, come see our show. And they say, what's it about? We go, we don't know. Um, <laughs> you have to yell things at us, <laughs> and then we'll make it up. And then within a year, it was um, around the block uh, lineup and became this big cult thing. And then I moved to, uh, my friend uh, Ryan Stiles got, uh, was doing Second City for Expo. And he had moved out there and I moved out a little bit afterwards. He called me and said, hey, they're looking for someone in the touring company. Uh, I told him about you, why don't you audition? So I did and uh, this was the person auditioning me. And there was this whole thing about picking up after yourself and washing dishes that I didn't quite understand what I had to do <laughs> with the process. Um, so, um, but, uh, yes, it was all about board until it wasn't. <laughs> and then uh, we moved, uh, Deb had, um, with her writing partner, uh, Linda Cash, had written this um, series that got picked up by Imagine Television. So we moved down to L.A. And this, I mean, this part, there's a whole long story, and Deb was seven months pregnant when we moved down there, gave birth, went back to work 10 days later. She was producing, big acting, big, big writing. Mistake. Yeah, and I, I couldn't work, I didn't have paper, so I was looking after um, our daughter, which was great. And then I got a Who's line, she was two months old. I just filmed my last one, and she just turned 33. So it's been a good, <laughs> steady job. <laughs> Um, I will never, um, 
underplay how important that show was to my life. I mean, obviously, I, no one really knew what improv was really before that show. Or, I mean, people knew, but not in the mainstream. And that show gave us all a career. Otherwise, I certainly wouldn't be here. Um, I'd probably still be married to you. <laughs> <laughs> but your mother would not love me as much as she does. <laughs> no, no, she would not. No. So it's, I mean, I, uh, I've been very fortunate in my life in, in pretty much every area. With the, uh, I've been very lucky. The fact that Whose Line came along showcased the one thing I can do gave me a career. The fact that um, this woman hired me and then seduced me in a canoe. <laughs> True story. Um, and that's worked out also. I mean, uh, we'll be 35 years. Four? 35 years, 35 years, years January, January 8th. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and I think also improvising leaked into our life. We decided you know, we're going to use the rules of improv in our life. We're going to start saying yes to things that may be a little outside of our comfort zone and see where it takes us. Our very first test, we were asked to go to the Congo. And it was like, what? We just <sighs> said we were going to say yes to things. <laughs> so we went to the, it was with World Vision to sort of spotlight um, kids who needed sponsorship. And it became one of the best things uh, we ever did in our life. It, yeah. Um, it, it was amazing. We were in the jungle uh, with people who were living in abject poverty, but still had this amazing spark. You know, Deb was doing the hokey pokey with all the kids by the river. It was just uh, an amazing trip. And so and since then, we've really tried to um, make that a big part of our life. Yeah. That answer was way too long. I'm sorry. You can cut this, right? No. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we're live. Yeah. yeah. Oh, OK. Huh. <laughs> I want to touch on your advocacy work in a bit, but I'd love to go back to, again, as I mentioned in my intro about choosing a career of whimsy and creativity is not one that a lot of people would say that's a good choice. That's not a logical career choice. Go be a marine biologist. Did well. either, I don't know, in my mind, when I wanted to be a marine biologist, it really was dolphin trainer. But yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I wanted to work at the aquarium. Um, but was that ever something that was told to you? Did you ever feel that from anyone saying, or did anyone ever say to you, maybe you should consider a more logical career path? Because a career in the arts is tough. It's really tough. Yeah, no one said it to me. Yeah. My parents were really supportive. <clears throat> they thought I was all that. And uh, my dad was very funny. Um, he, w he was a chartered accountant, but he was an ACTRA member. And he, <laughs> chartered yeah, accountant? Got a loop? <laughs> um, he was an ACTRA member, did a lot of small parts. He did a lot of commercials. My mom was a singer. And um, they thought it was great. Um, and I don't know, when you're young, you, you don't worry about <clears throat> how much money you're going to make. You're so obsessed with the doing of it. And uh, our daughter at one point asked us, because we since she was little, we just take her to theater, take her to theater, take her to theater. And um, uh, we were at Stratford, or Shaw, I think. And she said, so how do you live if you are an actor in the theater? And I said, well, it depends. But if you're a young actor and you're playing smaller roles, um, you have an apartment and the posters from your show or your art, and you're thrilled. And you're l doing what you love to do. And that's how I felt, and that's what we told her. Yeah, most of the people who were against me were the people who were hiring. <laughs> uh, <laughs> My, uh, my, fa my, my parents were very um, typical Scottish parents. Uh, but my father always said, uh, if you love it, do it. That it's Tell the, the newspaper story, please. Oh, my father would come um, to shows I was in. He would always bring a newspaper in case it got boring. <laughs> so there'd be times they'd be doing the show, and you'd hear, Russell, Russell, Russell. <laughs> <laughs> We've lost him. <laughs> Um, and my mother, um, she would send me match 
box covers that say, so you want to be a lawyer on them. <laughs> and it wasn't till I was on Hollywood Squares that she kind of accepted it. <laughs> it's like, oh, you've made it now. Yeah. yeah. But, but yeah. she would tell him random things like, who did she want you to ask for to hire oh, you? Oh, yeah. She would call up and go, I was watching Kathy Lee and Regis. <laughs> Barbara Mandrell was on. She seems lovely. Why don't you call her? <laughs> and I went, Dead serious. I went, Barbara Mandrell, the, the country singer? And she went, yeah, she seems very nice. And I said, well, I'll look in my celebrity Rolodex. <laughs> but, yeah, so there was always someone that she would call up. And she still does it every once in a while. Like, why aren't you on... I think she did, why weren't you on Friends? It's like, <laughs> uh, so many reasons, Mom, but... <laughs> He was headlining in Vegas years ago with Drew and uh, Ryan, uh, and they had their pictures up on the giant, iconic Caesar's Palace. And Isabel, his mom, said, oh, so you're in Vegas. Is anybody going to see it? And he said, um, well, yeah, Mom, it's Vegas. So it's now going to be on the television? And Colin said, no, oh, well, then, maybe someone will see you and give you a job. <laughs> Those, my, my, I just realized my career was built on revenge. <laughs> it's funny, I, when you were saying that, I immediately think about how many of us who are actors have well-intentioned people going, you know what you should be on? The Netflix. How, you should be on Netflix. Yeah. Yeah. You should just get on that. You're like, yes, I should. Are, are they hiring? Like, right. like, I would love to be on the Netflix. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, people don't really understand. They, they think every actor is rich and every... Mm -hmm. uh, I guess, and it's the easiest job in the world. And sometimes it is, but not often. It's, it is a lot of... It's like people who say, well, models. Uh, modeling must be easy. Uh, and that is... Not that I've ever modeled, but I, <laughs> I have seen I, that is grueling work, grueling yeah. work. So, yeah. well, and with that being said, would you have any advice for anyone who either is an aspiring actor, an aspiring creative, or maybe just somebody who's thinking about, well, this may be the second part of my life and I want to switch into a second act? Go on. I actually was speaking to a lovely pair of people tonight. And I said, it's so funny when we get to a certain age um, and someone says, oh, you're so brave to do that, as our lovely hostess was talking about <laughs> earlier. And I think it's funny when people talk about it being brave because the example I was using, if you're a visual artist and you're at a, uh, a market and you've got your wares out, you don't feel brave that people are coming up to look at what you've got to sell. So if you know that you've got something in you, that you are talented, and you've got something to offer, you're giving them a gift. It's Woo! not brave at all. So go for it. I, I, remember I remember talking to some visual artists about that. And I think acting is so interesting because there isn't aware you are the where, right? Yeah. It's not like here is, I'm a table maker, here is the table that I made. Yeah. If somebody says, I hate your table, you can say, that's fine, you hate the table, but you don't hate me. But acting, if somebody says, I hate your acting, you're like, huh, that is my soul that I've literally laid out in front of you. That I feel like they're like, would you agree with that or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, First of all, Colin has a theory about people. Would you oh, like to share it? People are idiots. <laughs> Thank you. Allies, allies! <laughs> yeah, I mean, screw you with your... It's terrible what people say. But you've just got to stop <laughs> listening to your inner voice. What? Uh, no, <laughs> I, I was thinking about the uh, lunch we had when you were bought. Oh, jeez. You know, Colin and I, we just had one a couple weeks ago where you're auctioned off. Gilda's Club, the wonderful Gilda's Club. Yeah. 
And we love them. We would do anything for them. And usually yes. they're, they're, the people are oh, lovely. Yeah. These people we had lunch with last week, just wonderful. But we went to one. I don't know if anyone knows who Neil Crone is. He's a wonderful actor. Yeah. He's a lot, he was my brother's best friend. I was his older sister's friend. We went to high school together um, at the soon-to-be renamed Sir Johnny MacDonald. And um, um, we went to this lunch... And the woman who purchased us uh, was with two other people, and they were lovely, asking about things. She was all over Colin and how <laughs> wonderful he is, and as she should be. We expected that. We knew that at this lunch we were the professor and Marianne. <laughs> and um, when they were, and the rest. So she's talking away to him, and then she turns to us. Like, can you think, what's happening right now? She turns to us and said, well, and you three, the great Sheila McCarthy was with us as well, and she says, you three, well, sometimes I can't believe it happened. She said, well, I thought to prepare for this lunch, I'd watch Little Mosque on the Prairie. And I have to say to you, and did this, P-U. <laughs> and then she went, P U, like that you have to repeat the P U. <laughs> that we didn't get the P U to begin with. What was that? We were confused by you holding your nose, and we just didn't know what to say because, as my friend always says, because we are stunned by rudeness. <laughs> People, why didn't I say that? Because you are stunned. Yeah. And she just turned away. We hung out in the parking lot for an hour after that, laughing so hard. And now whenever Sheila and I are at something together, uh, I, I, went, I went to her, um, uh, her premiere of a women talking in New York with her, and then someone will say something, we'll just say, P.U., 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 P.U. It was just unbelievable. Yeah. And so you have to go, um, you know... You either have to let it go or you've got to come back with a great comeback line. And I decided a few years ago because I'm obsessed with Christmas and I'm obsessed with white Christmas. And Bing Crosby... The movie, she's not a racist. <laughs> <laughs> and the proof of that is I didn't even think of that. And there's a moment where Rosemary Clooney says something awful to Bing. And Bing goes, well, that's quite a remark. And so I thought, that's going to be my thing. When somebody says, you know, gee, uh, you, boy, you've aged. Well, that's quite a remark. But I don't, because I'm stunned by rudeness. <laughs> Um, Laura Hall, who plays the music on Who's Line, mm. she had a next door neighbor who came over and said, hey, finally, finally saw your show. She went, oh, what do you think? Just four assholes playing charades. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to argue. <laughs> Oh, yeah, so uh, were we were giving advice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I so uh, do it. It's, it's great. I it's rewarding. One. Yeah. Um, my thing always is, if this is something that you can't see yourself not doing, if it's something that you love so much you have to do it, then you have to do it. There's no reason not to. I mean, there's plenty of reasons not to, but there's just as many reasons you should. And why not go with the positive and see what happens? It's so easy to get... Uh, bogged down by the negativity and people it's always easy for people to tell you why you can't do something it always seems harder for them to say the reasons you can even though a lot of times it's actually easier to do it and yeah you see exactly what the landscape is and where you fit in whether you, this is exactly what you do want uh, yeah so do it and don't do have it. a back and don't don't have a backup plan don't have a backup. Plan. Yep, that's the way to do, do it. it. <laughs> My logical brain hates that. <laughs> but you know what's interesting about, like, uh, and I think the, for me, 
having a career in medicine, being a very science, logical brained person, the greatest thing for me to get out of that, because it's not, it's not healthy to be that all the time. And I think when you're in a career path like medicine, like law, like a lot of things that demand tunnel vision focused on the goal, it's really hard to remember that you loved the creative part of your life. And what was so great for me was improv, because that is completely illogical. You can't plan. There's, there are a little bit of rules, but there really aren't any rules. You can't memorize anything. Thank you just God. have to say, <laughs> for me, I love that. <laughs> um, I love the memorizing, but it was terrifying, but so freeing. And I would love to hear more about your thoughts on improv, especially for actors and aspiring creatives or people kind of stuck in that logical brained mind. But first, I need to shout out the old dance hall players. <laughs> My improv troupe that I perform Hello. with, who are, came all the way from Aurelia. If you. Yeah. And my two Second City classmates who are also here who flew in from the States, which yeah, is really lovely. exciting. But I, I think what is really interesting about improv is you really have to, like you were saying, Colin, you just have to get out there and do it. You just get thrown up on stage and whatever happens, happens. And that's terrifying and freeing at the same time. What was improv for you both? I know obviously pivotal in both your incredible careers, but what does improv feel like for you? It feels like you're a kid doing a show in your garage, mm -hmm. and you have no one judging you. It feels when it's, Cole and I do a lot of shows together, and it's nice for me because I trust him so much. Also, if the audience has made suggestions, and let's be honest, I can't remember what they've said. <laughs> I think we all know that. I haven't got a clue. And at the moment, I'm looking right at them. Yeah, good, good, gone, <laughs> gone. So I know he'll save me in those things, but it feels, it just feels like old you, old, uncritical, um, I can't explain it for the, you just don't have an inner critic in your head and you're just going, but you're also weaving something. You're listening. We live in a world where never before has there been so little listening um, to each other. Um, and, and, and when you're improvising, you've got to listen. It's all about, it's all about listening and building. That feels fantastic. It just feels fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, it's being uh, childlike in a mature way. Yeah. <laughs> um, because I found out recently, uh, mirrors lie. Um, <laughs> So it, it really is, uh, yeah, I don't, whatever problems I have during the day, whatever physical ailments I have, when I'm out there, there's, I'm doing things that I know I'm going to pay for later. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it really is freeing. And I, I, improv certainly helped me come out of my, my shell uh, because of the success of Whose Line. The guy on Whose Line, Deb always called the other, because it wasn't me, <laughs> in a way. I mean, obviously it was, but it was a, it was a, a incredibly exaggerated uh, a version of me. But because of that, I had to learn to sort of come out of myself and be able to talk uh, during interviews and talk to fans. So it really opened up that part of my life because I was never very good at small talk or talking to people or feeling comfortable with people. I only felt comfortable with people if I was on a stage in front of them with no script, which is weird. <laughs> but, uh, but through improv, as Dev was saying, 
you know, people always say, how can you improvise? It's so difficult. And it, it truly isn't. It's, we have to do the things we don't do in life and we're supposed to. It's listening, it's working with uh, your partners, it's building them up, it's having fun, it's exploring all the different avenues you can go down. And sometimes you fail and you embrace that failure because that teaches you something that hopefully you won't do next time or you may do it again next time and you'll fail again. But um, it really, I think, taught us not to um, be consumed about failing and just putting yourself out yeah. there. And when you go out on stage, the best improvising is when you go out and your partner goes out and your goal is to set the other person up. Make the other person look fabulous. You are not intending to be funny. You are not intending to own the scene. But if you both go out with that objective, it's magical. And it's something you can do at any age. We have a friend who is a wonderful improviser and a wonderful improv teacher, Kate. And she um, teaches so many different people, seniors, folks who are dealing with serious illness. Um, and she, her classes are just, everyone just says, they're magical because there's no expectation, just improvise. It's a great, I do a show with a hypnotist where he hypnotizes people and then I improvise with them. And it's been fascinating to work Coming with Coming to people. Toronto this spring. That's right. Mervish. Mervish, Mervish has it. It's, it's fascinating to watch people in a trance <laughs> who I've never worked with before come up with the most amazing offers because they're not thinking. They're reacting to everything I say or the hypnotist says. Um, we had, and every night we, we find a superstar. We had this one young lady who was amazing and afterwards I was talking to her and she said, you know, I have like social anxiety. It's crippling. I don't know why I, I went up, but that was the best hour I've ever had in my life. And she was going to go out and look f uh, for improv classes and hopefully join an improv troupe. Uh, and it really is, once you get out of your head, I had to, this is so rambly, I had to um, improvise in an MRI for an hour and a half <laughs> because this doctor was doing um, a study on what happens to the brain when you uh, improvise. Oh, I love this. Yeah. <laughs> And what happens is the part of the brain that deals with self-criticism, the activity disappears and creativity um, starts to build. And the same thing happens when you're hypnotized. When you're hypnotized, that part of your brain that embarrasses you is gone. And didn't he also do a jazz musician? The, uh, yeah, a jazz and a visual, and a visual artist. artist. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, I mean, I, the benefits of improv, and not only creatively and for, for entertaining, science is starting to use improv and businesses. It really is great to be able to just think outside the box and go into a direction that maybe you hadn't thought of before. Um, and it may, uh, again, lead to nothing, but it may lead to something. So why not? And I think we're seeing that that kind of intersection or intertwining of arts and science. I don't know about you all, seeing it a lot more, at least I know in my medical world, there is a lot more of that, of people saying, oh, maybe if the fact that we've tunnel visioned all the scientists into medicine, maybe we should branch out and start teaching them creativity again. And you always know, see these improv classes for, um, for yeah, for medical professionals, that was at the beginning of the pandemic, they did improv classes for all the frontline workers. And you know, because there's such a benefit to releasing that part of your brain that I think has been like exactly what you were saying, not just shut down from a, ooh, it's been shut down, but literally in an MRI, they showed that it was and could be reignited again. Yeah. That's so exciting. That's really cool. Let me my brain think One of my favorite <laughs> scenes in uh, Apollo 13 is when they come in with all the all the different props, I call them, and say, here, they have to get back to Earth, use this. Yes. And they have to um, 
and that's exactly what should be happening with yes. science. That's one of our McMorty family mottos is work the problem. Yes, the oh. Apollo 13. Yeah, this yes, did. <laughs> well, I would love to hear, speaking about, again, your improv careers, but any anytime, if you have any favorite, memorable, funny, scary, on-set or on-stage stories. <laughs> Oh, you have the, the bear. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> no, you don't. Not the popular it. show on FX. You, this you, is an you actual. You don't have to tell it. Yes, this this was great. Um, so I was doing a show called Androids. It was a um, children's show about these young people who uh, are into science and. Um, the lovely Jane Eastwood um, played their grandmother, and for one season, I was her boy toy. Um, so <laughs> so um, in this show, um, I go camping with the kids. Um, we're canoeing, the canoe overturns, we get separated. Then we uh, come back together and we encounter a bear. And the, the show was teaching of things to do when uh, um, you come across a bear, how to survive camping, blah, blah, blah. So uh, the day of the shoot with the bear, um, the bear's in his trailer. <laughs> and um, I mean, and he had an extensive resume. He'd been. He was the bear. He was the bear in the bear. And he, he, um, he was a grizzly, I think. Giant, giant head. So um, we're setting up the scene, and the trainer was there. and. Our actress safety person was going over what was happening. She was saying, "So, what's going on?" He goes, "Well, there's this uh, big rectangle um, with electrified uh, strings. So if he touches it, he gets a mild shock, and he'll go back in." And she goes, "Well, what happens if that doesn't work?" He said, "Well, in 25 years, that's never happened." <laughs> and she goes, "Yeah, but what happens if something?" He said, "It'll never happen." As God is my witness, I'm, I can't even believe we're talking about this. It's not, she said, but what? He said, it's not going to happen. So I'm there with the kids. <laughs> uh, we're, we're with the kids. They go, action. The bear comes towards us. Then I hear the animal trainer go, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> so he gets, the bear got shocked, but instead of going backwards, he went forwards. And so he's out. So there's me and the three kids, and I'm standing there going, I can outrun oh, two of them. <laughs> this is real life Jurassic Park. It is. Um, there was a um, lovely um, assistant PA there, and she immediately went into, she got bigger, so I had to follow her because I had to, <laughs> I'm the adult here. And the bear just kind of walked up towards us and then went into the woods then um, the trainers ran after him. Shooting was done for the day. <laughs> because all the parents were also in the video village just off to the side. And so nobody could say anything. It was just total silence except for the heavy footprints of this, this bear. And the kids were traumatized. The director was traumatized. The parents were traumatized. I was throwing out some bits. They weren't going for it. <laughs> um, so that, w that was it. But um, it, it, tur it turned out the bear was just, I, I think, kind of bored. He'd been kind of cooped up for a while. And it all worked out nicely. So it just became a, a good story rather than a tragic. <laughs> <laughs> Colin Mockery outran two kids. <laughs> and with his knees. Exactly. We were not surprised. easy. Not easy. <laughs> you, oh, well, you, I mean, um, this show that Deb did Careful. when we were in L.A., you oh, had God. quite an eclectic uh, yeah. group of guest stars. We did 65 episodes of this thing called My Talk Show. It was with Ron Howard's company, Imagine. In four and, months. In four months. Oh, wow. And um, uh, we had guests, um, like, from Little Richard. I was nine months in it and four days pregnant doing a rap with Dr. Dre. <laughs> <laughs> and also that pregnant tapping with, um, tap dancing with Peter Allen. And it turned out to be like the last month of his life, but I idolized Peter Allen. We had a million great guests, but oh my God almighty, the behavior on that show, it was 
Yes. It was our, um, it was certainly my first experience with Hollywood <clears throat> stuff. And we were just two little Canadians who, you know, were excited about our child coming. People were throwing scripts across. Slamming their doors. But our favorite was the last day we were done. The show was done. And we were leaving. It was at, at Gulch, um, Gower Gulch Studios. And we were leaving to go back to our home. And uh, we realized, like, just the turnover in Hollywood, right? But you don't think of that. Your show's been canceled. We were grateful, frankly. We were so done. Um, but we were heading back. And it was like, oh my god, we forgot her binky. Uh, so we had to go back for her favorite binky. And of course, as you know, parents decide which one's their favorite binky. They don't decide. So Colin phones to tell them we're coming back, phones my talk show. As we left, we're saying goodbye to the my talk show switchboard. Phones, honest to God, four minutes later, uh, good morning, Revenge of the Nerds. <laughs> Honest to God, they must have been lurking in behind potted plants until we left, and now they're manning the phones and it's their show. Yeah. And we thought, yeah, that's... That's lovely. That's Hollywood. <laughs> well, speaking of your daughter, you are very involved in advocacy within the LGBTQ2 plus community. I would love to hear if you'd like to share more about your work with the, that community, just given especially the charity that we're supporting Thank today. you. Yes, our beautiful daughter, <clears throat> who we adore beyond words. <clears throat> um, we're, um, we, we always like to spread the good word about uh, trans and about anyone in the queer community. We think they are the special people. And uh, we, um, we will always, uh, we support something called Rainbow Camp. In fact, Colin did a show called LOL, Last One Laughing, and he won. And the folks at Rainbow Camp, yeah, but the folks at Rainbow Camp didn't know about the show and didn't know he was working for them. So they're watching it on air and found out that he had won $100,000 for the camp. So that was uh, great. Yeah. But I'm getting into more advocacy work. I'm, I'm working with uh, a wonderful person named Joe Vanicola, and they are such an advocate, such an advocate, and they and another uh, woman named Emma Wakelin, who is in the political world, she's a trans woman, identifying she, her, and we have decided we are starting a situation where we're going to lobby the government to get trans facial surgeries uh, covered, um, and um, because so many trans folk, uh, you know, have esteem and dysphoria issues because, you know, you look in the mirror. Um, and I um, speak to trans parents who are struggling um, and who um, sometimes frustrate me, but I listen, I'm not an expert, um, but sometimes frustrate me when they say things like, but, you know, I was hoping she'd have kids. Under my breath, I'm saying, it's not your life, it's not your life. But to them, I'm saying, talk about that more. Tell me a little bit of how you feel. But I do listen to people. Um, you know, and, people are idiots. And, <laughs> yes, yes. And I, um, I'm a frequent caller to some of our political um, uh, people. No, uh, like every couple of days. <laughs> and I will say things like, Hi, it's Deb McGrath again, I give my address, but I'm extremely calm. And I say, first of all, I would like to tell, I don't want to divide us politically, but I'll say it, I would like to tell the Premier never to, word the, never to use the word indoctrination again. Stop it, stop it. And I said, my husband and I, a million trans parents would love to come and tell you why it's important that these children have other people to speak to. Because as our daughter said to us, and we couldn't be closer to this kid, but she said, you've got to understand, because I was hurt, your friends knew, to tell the people that gave birth to you that you are not presenting as that person, and to break their hearts, or even though she thought we would trust, 
and that we would support, which we did in a heartbeat. Um, and I said, does the premier know anything about um, the 519, say, or Trans Ontario? So I, I'm busy in the mornings, let's just say. <laughs> I, it just, uh, there's a, um, a great thing. I just posted it on my uh, story. And uh, I don't really understand the story. I'm a boomer. What's the difference, I say to my daughter, between the story and the thing? She explains, I still don't know. But she'll say, I think that's good for your story. Is it? Is this good? Why is this good for my story? So I posted this great thing, John Stewart. Look up the latest thing he was saying about Trent. He just is my idol. But yeah, I want to make a difference in that world. You were talking, where did she go? About allies, about the allies in the audience. But it's one thing to be an ally and support. I encourage allies to speak up and speak to your local politicians when you think something's going south for women and queer people. Woo! They both need your support. Or do you, dear? Well, uh, uh, let me explain what Deb was talking about there. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, well done. No. That's um, why I said for women. Uh, yeah. uh, um, I mean, part of the, part of the deal of uh, loving this woman is um, loving how upset she gets at the world. And uh, she's passionate, uh, she's always there for the underdog, she's always there for anyone who needs any kind of help, and it's, it's inspiring. And it, it totally inspired our daughter, who is uh, one of the most empathetic uh, human beings I, I've ever met. So uh, again, lucky um, I've been a part of, of that. I, um, I also have a lot of shame in that when um, Kinley first came out, I, it was during, a, I think it was around the Trump inauguration time. And it was, I don't know if you remember this, things were don't negative. Don't take us back there. Please don't take us back there. <laughs> there was a lot of negative stuff on uh, social media. And I uh, said, Kinley, um, I wanted to post about how your grandmothers, a 91-year-old at that point and an 87-year-old, just totally accepted um, this. Just totally accepted with love. And I just say I wish people of uh, other generations could easily follow that. And she said, fine. So I posted it. Then I got um, an email from a, a trans man who runs a improv theater in London, England. And he said, I just wanted to congratulate you on um, how you're supporting your daughter and uh, on your daughter. Can I just ask you, next time you're doing Whose Line, to keep an eye on all the homophobic and transphobic um, things that you do? And immediately, I was covered in sweat, thinking of all the things that we had done over the years. and. There, I mean, there's no way to excuse it except that it was done out of pure ignorance. Um, we were going for a joke because we needed a laugh, and we didn't think, oh, I just disparaged an entire segment of society, and a segment of society that doesn't need us piling on um, them. So uh, I said, absolutely, and I brought it up on uh, Facebook, and then uh, various improv troops around the um, uh, country, around the world, sort of, um, sort of chimed in, and we started talking about this is something we should watch about. Not only that, but I mean, I, I think things had gotten better for uh, uh, women, certainly from when I was there. I'm sure there's still some. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, talking about uh, in, in the improv. Uh, oh, world. in the improv. Not... I thought you meant in the world. I no, no, say. no. <laughs> No, I mean, it's all fixed. <laughs> no, I was talking oh, about... Oh, good in, now. In the, I know I said people are idiots, <laughs> but <laughs> I understand. 
Um, so it is better. In it, the it's something that uh, people have become more aware of, and it's become something that before improv shows, um, the improvisers get together and uh, have a sort of uh, a little meeting, saying, "This is, you know, what I feel comfortable uh, doing. You can do this. You, this is what you can talk about." Uh, about me, I, I'm fine if you want to talk about my uh, sexual preference or my, my gender. There was one woman who said, um, I don't want anyone to touch my breasts. You can slap them. And I thought, true. <laughs> this is true. And I thought, I can't even think of how that would go where after doing, she said I could. <laughs> In fact, she brought it up. Yeah. So it, it has been better, and I would hope that that would, not that particular thing, but um, just the openness, and because I truly believe, obviously, all um, prejudice comes from ignorance, absolute ignorance, from not knowing, from just making assumptions, from being taught. Uh, so the more you can learn, the better chance you, you have just to, you know, Get this world closer to a Star Trek future. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Where we're all we're yeah. working together. Because we talk about how the pendulum has swung too far. And in some regards, it may have done. But I always think to myself when people will say, um, oh, you're saying that now, or they're saying that now. If you're saving the feelings of one person, what skin is it, what, what sweat is it for you to make an effort to say something that has also been deemed politically correct? Um, you know, we were having a discussion the other night about homeless, people experiencing homeless, unhoused, and then somebody, oh, it's exhausting. Is it though? Are you exhausted? <laughs> Because they sure friggin' are. Wow. Can, first of all, can I just say, impressed that you said friggin'. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm not good in that department. And I swear to God, just as the F came out, I went, recorded podcast, 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 <laughs> podcast. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't say it when I phone in the premiere. Oh, no, that's true. Yeah. I want to. I say it to him. He actually says when he's out of town, I'll say, I miss you so much. And he'll say, I miss you yelling at the paper. <laughs> so, yeah, you do. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting that we talk about that not only in improv, you know, what are you comfortable with? where are you comfortable touch, but also, you know, some of the acting classes, one of the acting classes I just took, a lot of that, that was a big conversation that we were having before any scene, where are you comfortable and whatnot. And I think that's something that I never knew because I'm so new into this industry. I never knew the world prior to that, but hearing the stories of people, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> those are my acting teachers over there. Yeah, <laughs> um, ha hearing stories of the world prior to mm -hmm. what's now been changing, oh. and you hear—I agree, right? You hear all the time. It's funny, my dad and I were just talking about that. The pendulum is way over here. It takes a generation or two to swing the pendulum back, but then it'll take another generation or two to bring it to a happy medium? Question mark. I don't know. Yeah. But it's exciting to see the change that's happening. But we always talk about you know the intention behind people's words. Well, I didn't intend to do that. That's great, but like intention also needs to come with action as opposed to turning it into prejudice, yeah. like you were saying. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes no. people don't genuinely understand, but my thing is ask questions. A ask about it. That's how you find out. And if you're uncomfortable, especially if it's a trans situation, ask if you can ask. I mean, our daughter always says, ask me, mm -hmm. ask me. Mm -hmm. But not everyone wants that, so ask if you can ask. I, I, I guess I just don't understand why these things are so hard because they're always things that involve inclusion. So, big old question mark there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Big old, yeah. like literally that one. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have, as we're wrapping things up here, any final words of wisdom or advice a lot of people in this audience, and I can see them with their beautiful buttons on, were guests on my show who are second act actors, people who chose to change careers into acting or simultaneously pursue acting. 
Do you have any words of wisdom or advice to wrap things up? Uh, I would say always listen to yourself, but don't always take your advice. <laughs> <laughs> There's always, you know, there's, there's that thing where, you know, you say, I don't know if I do this or this. And someone will say, well, I'll flip a coin. And you immediately know what you want that to be, what you want the answer to be. So just do it. Yeah. Um, thinking too much has ruined the world. <laughs> <laughs> it really has. If we were, I, and of course, you know, just spontaneous action also is not a great thing. <laughs> but a happy medium. Um, do what you love doing, because that's going to be your life. Um, why get stuck in something where you dread going to, where you're not enjoying the people you're working with? Change it. There's no rule that says you have to stay with the same thing forever. You can change. You can change whenever you want. The most interesting people often do. Yeah. And don't be afraid to make a fool of yourself because we all worry about what people think. And you know what? They're not thinking about us. <laughs> I don't even, yeah, they're not. And you think, what are they going to think? They're focused on their own negative voices. So go for it and, and True, I mean, take chances. Just take chances with everything you do. That's what we're trying to do. Deb's 97. <laughs> Next week. And she's, no, um, I always. I always love that. <laughs> I know you do. Tells it. That's, and yet because I I'm always so do it. I'm so afraid that someone's going to go, wow, she looks good, and it'll be, what the? <laughs> <laughs> 97. No. I said to him, people might go, wow, pretty good. Well, it's just no. because I think it's I don't un hear that. unthinkable that anyone would Is think that. Is it though? What I'm no, saying are you is, kidding? In this you light, you look great. <laughs> <laughs> um, you don't know what the idiots are thinking. That oh, well, that would have to be like an incredible idiot who would think Let's you're nice. All right, we'll talk about this at home. <laughs> The only things we ever fight about are fake things. The most consistent fight we've had for our lives is, I don't believe the boys on Friends should have taken the girls' apartment. That was they Monica's made a bet. They made a grandmother, bet. and I don't think real friends do that. So that is our biggest and argument. And let me just why. say again, Friends was up against whose line is it anyway? So, who was and watching? Shame. Yeah. No, um, again, um, as you know, I love you a, a lot. And I as always I. say, yeah. Deb is the youngest person I know because she is. She's always, she never gets stuck in any ideas. She's always checking out new things, except for the story on Instagram. <laughs> I just don't get it. But, What's the difference? Um, and I, to be with someone like that, it just kind of uh, leaks into your life. So, I also advise you find someone like this to put I'll in your life. Uh -huh. I'll give one other piece of advice, and it's something I do in my life that, you know they say there's no unselfish act, and in my first year in philosophy, I argued with my teacher. Argued. No, but I, you do that. I wasn't thinking of me. How did it make you feel? Good. Well, then it wasn't an unselfish act. But here's what I do, and I love it. Because it changes. I walk up to people, particularly women, who I think look great, and I tell them. That is one of the happiest things I do in my life. Strangers and say, you look great in that color. You look beautiful. Or I just walk by and just go, come on. <laughs> And people will go, thank you. Oh, my God, that made your day. And I started doing it years ago, genuinely, because I went, I got to tell that woman she looks great. And now I've kind of gone a little kooky with it. <laughs> but I'm telling you, tell people they're great. Tell your friends something you love about them. I started writing letters to my friends years ago, and one of them that does not like that yet said to me, <laughs> 
I don't know if I can ever look you in the face again. <laughs> but she did. Tell your friends what you think of them. Because I promise you, they need to hear it. So that's my piece. Deb McGrath, the call and mockery, everybody! So, so just a little token of appreciation here for you. There's also been a donation in both your names made to the Get Real movement as well as a massive thank you for coming today. Thank you so much. All right, the party's going to keep going. We're going to bring back up Al Val Comedy. One more time for Devin Collins. But also, <laughs> I'm stopping you before you go off stage. Let's have a round of applause for Janet. We are so proud of her. We love her so much. wasn't it? Wasn't it heartwarming? I, I, I was so inspired by, like, they're such, they're such supportive trans parents, you know? And it does, yeah, it's nice to hear. And I'm, and I'm one of the lucky ones, too. My dad was super supportive of me. And uh, when I came out to him, it actually shocked me how supportive he was. Uh, but, but it shouldn't have been, you know what I mean? Like, the signs were all there that he was going to be an ally from the start. Like, he's a proctologist. You know what I mean? <laughs> and he's a really good one, too. They call him Ghostfinger. You don't even know he's in there. He's, like, really good. So, <laughs> that was nice. When I came out to my dad, he surprised me. He was like, yeah, I suspected something was up. I was like, Dad, how could you? I hid every vaguely flamboyant, stereotypically feminine thing about myself. I played sports, Dad. He was like, nah, you played soccer. <laughs> oh, <laughs> did I offend a bunch of British people in the corner? <laughs> Don't talk about the Queen's sport like that, mate. We support you in your journey and all, but fuck off, piss off. <laughs> Have a wank. <laughs> oh, that was so nice. I love the drive-by compliment thing, too. Like, I'm a big fan of those, too. But I'll know it. But, like, I won't lie. Um, the way she was describing it, like, I have, I've always done that my entire life. It's just, like, if you, if you see somebody on the street and you see something nice about them, it's just compulsive. I just say it. But I noticed that ever since I transitioned, there is a huge contrast in the way people receive those compliments. I think there is a gender dynamic at play. I am willing to admit it because when I was a guy and I would be like, hey, you look really cute in that dress. They're like, get off me. What do you want? I'll be like, no, I don't want to fuck you. I swear, I promise. <laughs> I just like your purse. <laughs> You know, uh, I do talk about the trans stuff a lot. It's not uh, like uh, I do get um, I do get the occasional criticism lobbied my way. I hear it. I hear people sort of in the background every once in a while. Somebody will it'll it'll get back to me. Somebody will be like, "That's all she ever talks about is the trans thing." And at first it used to hurt me, but like, but at the same time, of course it is. You know what I mean? Like, I'm two years into a transition, and so it has informed the way I interact with society, the way society engages with me. It's like a massive socio-political fucking thing right now. I'm in the middle of a global political shitstorm, so of course I'm going to talk about it. It informs everything right now. Yeah. And I'm two years in. So, so... You know what I mean? And like, I, I, I figure there are tells that, you know, I'm, clock, I'm a clocky trans woman and I don't mind that. It's like, how disappointing would it be to you guys if I went up here and just never addressed it at all? I think that would be shitty. <laughs> like, listen, hypothetically, if I was slowly turning into a goat. <laughs> if I was slowly turning into a goat, and I came out here with like tufts of fur growing on my elbows and I had two little nubby horns developing in my head. 
I had to hold the microphone in my wrists like this because my fingers were congealing into a pair of hooves. And I had the audacity to be like, being a millennial is weird, isn't it? You'd be like, being a goat is weird. The goat is the weird part. For a whole headlining set, if I was just like, people get mad when you tell them you're a vegetarian. You'd be like, stop, talk about the goat thing, fuck. So if talking about being trans is hack, then I'm the motherfucking goat, bitch. <laughs> All right, um, I'm gonna, this, this has been such an awesome experience. I wanna thank you guys for coming out. This was really fun. Give yourselves a round of applause. Yes. That was so inspiring and so lovely. Um, please stick around. Uh, you all have, uh, most of you have pins that say whether you've been a past guest on the show, or if you are going to be a future guest. So like, mingle, chat with each other, get to know what the experience was like or will be like. Uh, and uh, yeah, like chat, the bar is open. There's plenty of food everywhere. This is sponsored by Craig's Cookies. So yes, help yourselves, don't be shy. Talk to somebody, strike up a conversation, have some food, and enjoy the rest of the night. Thank you all very, very much.